Our friends at Perla are big proponents of simple, long-term investing, and now they're rewarding you for being a long-term investor too. Perla investors receive points every time they fund their account and invest. The more points you earn, the higher your chances to win one of their weekly prizes or the big prize at the end of the month. To get started, check out the competition terms and conditions and open your Perla account today using the links in your podcast player. This episode of the Australian Finance Podcast is proudly supported by GlobalX ETFs and the launch of the US100 ETF, better known as N100. N100 offers Australian investors exposure to 100 of the largest non-financial companies listed on the NASDAQ Stock Exchange. N100 focuses on innovation-driven companies, providing a growth tilt to core portfolio holdings. You can learn more about N100, including reading the PDS and TMD by clicking the link in your podcast player or by simply heading to globalxetfs.com.au. Hey there, here's a quick note. This podcast contains general financial advice only. That means it's not specific to you, your needs, goals, or objectives. So don't act on the information until you've spoken with your financial advisor. You'll find our full disclosure, disclaimer, and link to our financial services guide in the show notes. Hello, I'm Kate Campbell. And I'm Owen Rask. And you're listening to the Australian Finance Podcast. A podcast where we talk about money, finance, investing, and all of that good stuff. We're helping you invest your time and money better one podcast episode at a time. Yes, so please subscribe if you like the series. And don't forget you can find us on social media. We're on all the platforms. Kate, where can people go? You can find us on Instagram and Twitter at Rask Australia. That's R-A-S-K Australia. Mm -hmm. And I'm Owen Rask on Twitter. Or Owen Rask AU on Instagram. Beware the imitators. People like to copy us. Without further ado, let's jump in to today's episode. Kay Campbell, welcome to this episode of the Australian Finance Podcast. It is a wonderful to be back, Owen, for our share review episode for the month. Share review. We're that sharing a review with you. We are talking about Commonwealth Bank of Australia, otherwise known as CBA. Otherwise known as Combank. 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 That's Com-sec. the one. Got it in two. So, um, Combank, we're talking about uh, the, the company, Commonwealth Bank of Australia, uh, as part of a request. And we source like your insights and what you want to hear about when we do these episodes. We alternate months. One month we do a share, in this case, CBA. The next month we might do an ETF. So, let us know on socials. Jump into the RAS Core forums if you want to have your say on what we cover. Yes, and it's a good opportunity for us just to talk about companies and how we look at them and pull out some interesting details as long, alongside actually talking about share investing in general. Yeah, so this is a chance for you to kind of go inside the mind of how we think about investing and actually how do I research a company? And the idea behind this is to 50% educational, 50% trying to learn about a business that you might know and whose products and services you might use every single day. And by doing so, over time, if you've done five or ten of these, uh, you'll become a better observer of what happens in the world and how things work. Yeah, and it's about being curious about the world around you, whether or not you ever invest in individual companies, considering how much of your ETF CBA takes up. So Mm. as of when we're recording at the start of October, if I I just looked at the A200, the beta shares ASX200 ETF, Mm -hmm. CBA makes up 8% of the overall portfolio. So if you had $1,000 in the A200 ETF, around $80 would be invested in CBA. Yep. And that's just one of the big four banks. If you add up all big four banks, which is CBA, National Australia Bank, NAB, Westpac, and ANZ, Australian New Zealand Banking, that's around 20% of your ETF is in just four big companies, the four big banks. So if you own the A200 ETF, the VAS ETF, the STW ETF, the IOZ ETF, Monique, oh yeah. The percentages Um, will be similar. Yeah, very similar. So if you had $1,000 in A200, you would have $200 of that just in the big four banks. Yeah. That's effectively what you're getting. Yeah, and so that's why it's really interesting to learn about some of the top 10 holdings in your ETF because it is making up quite a big proportion. Yep, sounds good. Just for full, just cover all of our bases here. We're not recommending CBA. Uh, We are just doing a deep dive into it because it's what you want to hear. So when we talk about CBA, just try and take it on its merits. We're going to talk about the business. We're going to talk about like how the industry works. We're going to talk about some competitors. 
it's up to you to then form a view whether you want to invest in this thing or not. I'll, I'll, I'll have some concluding remarks about whether you could put it in a portfolio and how you could use it. Um, but just know that we're not recommending it. Neither of us invest in CBA. No, except for we also own ASX 200 ETFs. Yes, so we do. As I just mentioned, CBA will be in there and it will presumably be in our super funds because both of our super funds have exposure to Australian companies. Yep. And um, even the RAS Group, the actual our actual company has uh, some ETFs as well. So it yeah. owns some of these banks through the ETFs that it owns. And by your... ASX 200 ETFs or your super fund, I'd say most listeners would probably be invested yeah. in a way in CBA. So it's quite interesting to learn about this one. And even if you don't invest in it, you're probably impacted by it because it controls so much of the uh, mortgage market, which we're about to get to. It also controls so much of everything around us. Yeah, it has a huge impact on our If you use BMIT, like if you use different things, it might be connected in some way to CBA. Yeah, and it's very- wrong? Yes, it did. Very, well, you're very good, Owen. You could be a poet. Um, yeah, it's. I think once you start looking at CBA, you realise just how big of a company it is. It's really hard to even fathom mm. just how much of Australia is impacted by CBA and how involved it is in so many different parts of our financial ecosystem. Oh, yes. And uh, Scott Pape um, talked about credit savvy, if I'm not mistaken, which allows you to lock your credit score so people can't get credit under your name because your file is actually locked uh, and that's a business that's owned by CBA as well so there's so many different little businesses like Beamit as well um, yeah and there's a lot of businesses yeah. that CBA Bankwest. partially owns as well yeah they got you know they invest in early stage fintechs um, a lot of the big banks actually have venture capital arms as well where they mm. invest in emerging companies to try and kind of make sure that they're still relevant in the modern world Kate, give us an overview of CBA. What I'm particularly interested in is when did it start? Yeah. CBA started in 1911 under the Commonwealth Bank Act because it originally started as a government bank. Yeah, it actually started as the central bank, if I'm not mistaken. And it was doing a lot of the things that the Reserve Bank of Australia, as we know it today, because the monthly interest rate meeting (laughs) that we all sort of, oh, what happened this month? Um, Is my mortgage going up? Yeah, so CBA used to do a lot of those functions. It was a bank, but it also helped regulate yeah. the banks. The entire in economy. General. Yeah, so it was the bank. Yeah. And it basically ran the economy. Yeah, so founded in 1911, commenced ops in 1912. It was listed in 1991 because after a period of time, it was kind of found that they wanted to separate the functions of the Reserve Bank from Commonwealth Bank. So the government mm. started to split the Reserve Bank and make it its own entity and split off Commonwealth Bank and slowly it became a private bank. So the government didn't own the whole thing anymore. And then they listed it in 91 and then the government was slowly selling off part of its shareholding. AKA, that means that Commonwealth Bank went from being government owned to being owned by individual investors like shareholders. The people of Australia. Listed on the stock exchange is what Kate meant. And um, yeah, it basically means that since 1991, individuals have been able to own shares of this humongous bank, including employees of CBA itself. They got granted um, shares in the company that they worked for. And many, many, many people that work for CBA, even potentially still hearing this today, have become very, very wealthy thanks to owning CBA shares just from being employed by the bank. Yeah. I mean, if you if you have a look at it, CBA share price chart, it's done incredibly well over time. And what's also interesting, Kate, is that more if you still own your original CBA shares that you got in 1991, the dividends that you get every year now are worth 50% of your original investment price. Wow. So the dividends that Commonwealth Bank is paying because it's grown so much, the di- this would be like a dividend yield of like 50%. Yeah. And this is how I like to think about long-term investing. When you buy an investment, say you pay $5 a share, for example, it might only pay 20 cents in dividends today. But after 15 years, it might be paying a dollar of dividends and you still have your original shares. So that's when you start to get massive dividend checks in the mail. And that's compound interest, basically, um, for the dividends that you receive. Um, and CBA is one of those. Yeah, it's a big dividend player in Australia. And another company that people might not realize went on this exact same path is CSL. The name of CSL, which is the big um, biotechnology, biopharmaceutical business in Australia, 
was actually was actually called Commonwealth Serum Laboratories. That's where the CSL comes from. And so it too was owned by the government, just like Medibank Private. That was owned by the government as well. So many of these businesses started being as government run, just like the MBN Co is today. And then eventually they become private companies. Yeah. CBA is probably the most outstanding example. Yeah. And CBA has around 16 million customers. Mm-hmm. And that would be everything from Comsec to banking products to home loans to travel money cards, like the huge amount of products and services they offer. They employ nearly 50,000 people mm. in Australia huge. and overseas because they do have some overseas um, arms and locations. And they have more than 800,000 different shareholders. And that isn't including shareholders that will invest in CBA through their super fund or their ETFs. Yeah. So if you're one of the 2 million members of Australian super, chances are Australian super owns CBA shares on your behalf. So that is an incredible amount of shareholders. Yeah. Well, I was blown away when you did this research that it's, I think you've got this uh, in our notes, which is that they wanted last year to beef up their technology department. So they employed 800 more engineers. Yeah, I I was blown away. There's already I... 5,000 people in technology at CBA. Yeah, and their uh, their current goal at the moment is to get another 100 engineers every month, and they're adding that a lot to the AI, cyber, and data capabilities. And they've got multiple engineering hubs in Australia. It's crazy when you think about that. They're, in, they're saying, you can work from home, we're going to give you all these perks. So they've got a lot to offer these engineers, but they're really sucking up that technology capacity in Australia. Yeah. It's good for engineers because you're going to get paid heaps of money because you're yeah. <laughs> the intersection of technology and finance. So you get paid a lot of money. And CBA is almost like putting tech first now. Yeah. Well, it had, to be honest with you, it has since probably the early 2010s. Mm. Um, I remember reading an article, I think it was in 2013. Um, Jesus, am I really that old? <laughs> no. So it's 2013. Uh, and the headline was CBA is streets ahead of its competitors. And at the time, they were estimating that CBA, in terms of its technology, was years ahead of all the other banks. Um, and it's continually invested in technology. That's why it's got the best apps. It's got the best, you know, all these little offshoots and things that you can do. Like you said, your mortgage was like, what was it, a day? It was pre-approved? Yeah. Same day approval. Once I just sent through the documents after going through a phone call, um, there was one person that was allocated to me and like kept on my like case file the entire time. They had a really good online hub. I haven't seen others because yeah. I only have one mortgage. But um, yeah, I was just very impressed by the technology and the speed at which they could do approvals. And they, they wrote about that in their annual report last year about mm. how quickly they can approve using their technology and their risk management systems. They can approve home loans now and do pre-approvals. And even um, once I signed the contract, that the loan was actually processed really quickly. Yeah. Um, ANZ, for a time, there was like one to two months. <laughs> yeah, wow. <laughs> Sorry, ANZ. Um, and an interesting yeah. <laughs> thing about CBA is they really kicked off that school banking program in yeah. the 1930s. And Dolomites. that has been a huge driver because they get people on the platform very early on. Mm. And you you start, that's your very first bank account, your savings account, transactions account. And they were able to upsell products before they got, before things like upselling the credit cards got banned, they pushed different products on you as you graduated from school age. And that added a lot of people to their ecosystem. And a lot of the other banks didn't even have a chance or didn't try to crack into that part of the market because CBA just completely had their foot in the door there. But mm. in 2021, school banking in Victoria was banned. Well, that was 90 years yeah. that it operated. Such a good way to capture yeah. young Australians into your banking And now product. authorised deposit-taking institutions like CBA are not allowed in the classroom. Authorised deposit-taking institutions or ADIs is aka basically a bank. It's not exactly the same, but it's a bank. Um, so that worked really well for them. That's been cut off. Yeah. And they still acquire a lot of customers just naturally through like parents and all that sort of stuff, right? Like they have such a big presence not yeah. just through stores, but also online. Yeah, and just that brand awareness, because when you say, just think of the name of a bank, you're probably going to come up with one of those big four. Yeah, and it's probably going to be CBA that you think of first, to be honest, yeah. just given the sheer size. So the the way you can measure the size of a company in the stock market, which we've mentioned before, is the market capitalization. That's the value of all the shares that are available. It's a, 
It's $157 billion for CBA. To put that in context, let's go with the, say, National Australia Bank. National Australia Bank is $92 billion. So it gives you a sense of how much bigger CBA is. Yeah. Westpac, 74. So you just go down from there. Do you know what the biggest market cap company in Australia is? I think it's BHP. Okay. I'm we pretty should. sure. Let me just check that because CBA is number <laughs> two on the list. Um, and so if that's number two, yes, it's it's BHP with $200 billion at the time of recording. Wow. So Pretty incredible. Like, yeah. These are huge numbers. Yeah. Um, but they ebb and flow. Like you would say that CBA is a more reliable business because BHP is in the commodity cycle. So yeah. at sometimes CBA will be the biggest. Sometimes BHP will be the biggest. Um, the one that people don't really think about because we don't really have as much to do with it in Australia is actually Macquarie Group. Uh, we've talked about it on the show before, but Macquarie Group is what we call the fifth bank. So when we talk about the big four, yep. we're talking about CBA, NAB, Westpac, ANZ. Those are the ones. Yep. But then there's a fifth pillar that is emerging and they're emerging very quickly. Yeah, it's in your top 10 in your ASX 200 ETF. Yep, this is Macquarie Group. Yeah. And so... The difference, just as an FYI, the difference between what Macquarie Group does, Macquarie Bank, and what CBA does is CBA is what we call a retail bank. So like people like us, we get like, you know, retail bank, we go into it, it's in the store, it's right next to Sports Girl, you know, we can walk straight into it and we can get a mortgage, we can get a credit card, we can do all that. Whereas with Macquarie Group, Macquarie's always in the past been focused on high net worth individuals, private banking, sounds very exclusive. Um, even things like where companies go to do their banking, like big multinational companies and investments and that sort of stuff. Yeah, if a company wants to list or merge, they might use Macquarie. Yeah. But now Macquarie said, well, hey, that stuff, that retail stuff is actually really valuable. Let's go and do some of that. And so Macquarie is emerging and that's why their bank accounts, their term deposits there. They're growing massively yeah. in the home loan market as well for retail consumers. That's it. And so that's why when people look at the big banks, they a lot of people look at it and go, I want CBA for dividends because it's the biggest and it's kind of most reliable. Yeah. But I want Macquarie for growth mm. because Macquarie is growing and it's international and it's doing all this other stuff as well. So that's how a lot of people think about these two companies. Um, and they're both really impressive. Whereas the other three, to be honest, NAB, which is a leading business bank, mm. Westpac, which kind of does a bit of everything. It's kind of like CBA's little brother. Um, and then you've got ANZ, which spent a lot of time, it's dominant in New Zealand, but it spent a lot of time in Asia and just got wrecked. So it's kind of like CBA, then Macquarie is kind of the favorite banks amongst yeah. investors. So that's basically CBA overall, Kate, but it does a lot of different products and services. Yeah. I think it's like, even as I was going through the list of the products and services they offer, I've tried nearly all of them. Yeah. <laughs> and that's quite a long list. Like I've used in the past because I school banking program, I did have that Dolomites account. So I did oh have a gosh. savings and a transaction account through CBA. I've, I use some other different banks now, but I, I have used that. I've used their home loan now. I've used their travel card. I've used a credit card from them in the past. I've done cardless cash. I've used their ATM. I've been in the branch. I've banked checks. Comsec? I've used Comsec quite a lot. Yep. I've tried Comsec Pocket, their um, micro-investing style app that has just a small range of ETFs and lower brokerage to help mm-hmm. new many investors of, many get Many of our started. members use that to get started. Yeah. Yep. And even the foreign currency card, I was talking to Monique before, that they still exist and I've used them before when I've traveled overseas. And hmm. there might be better options for some of these products now that some of the fintechs and things can do it cheaper or differently. But CBA has really been there at multiple points throughout my life. And probably many listeners, if you really think about it, you've interacted with CBA before in some point. Yeah. I got CUA. CUA. <laughs> it's like... Isn't yeah. that health insurer as well? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe. Um, it's a credit union. Yeah. I think they merge with someone else. I don't even know what they do now. But I got that um, instead of Dolomites. I don't know if I was better or worse for it, but it made me unique, I guess. <laughs> So yeah. if for anyone else out there they got CUA as a, a preppy. They do business banking as well. <laughs> so small business loans. Yep. Yeah, heaps. So that's the big growth area for alongside technology for CBA is actually business banking. Yeah. For years, NAB has dominated business banking. So whereas CBA dominates mortgages, NAB has dominated business. Um and you know, I was actually chatting to the equity mates guys when we were in Sydney not long ago and I was talking to them about which bank did you go with for your business and we we're just talking about it and they're like NAB and I'm like yes NAB like it's just so much easier yeah. but now CBA recognizes this and they're like oh everyone's going across the street 
let's focus on this and let's make it better. Yeah. It's, it, you can just see if you've been using the CBA app for maybe 10 years, how much it's improved and how much money they've mm. spent on that and just integrating with different technology companies. They've got Marketplace now that you can get discounts to different stores and it comes up, even it prompts you to go and find lost money yeah. um, and do all sorts of things like that, which is quite interesting. Yeah. The, um, like for banking, CBA is very solid, but for investments, like in the past, they had a big focus on investing and financial planning and they own um, asset management businesses like I think it was Colonial was part of it. Yeah, um, so they've spun some things Yeah, they got rid of all that because they had to. Their um, Com Insure, which is the name of their insurance business, was the worst voted insurance business in Australia by advisors like for so many years. Yeah. And after the Royal Commission, that got chopped. Everything just left, basically, and they had to clean up their act. So they're not perfect. Yeah. Um, but And they're not alone in that either. Like all the other banks got raked over the coals, except for Macquarie, by the way, which is carefully sidestepped the Royal Commission. Um, yeah, and an interesting, yeah. while I was doing some research, it was just interesting to see how many loans of how many Australian mortgages are through CBA, or one of their yep. subsidiary companies. Um, and it's just, we what was I estimating? Around 26% of the Australian mortgage market for residential mortgages is through CBA. Yeah, so it's roughly 850,000. Yeah, but a bit of um, Kate did some napkin mass. <laughs> yeah, Kate did some um, I was looking analyst at the work. Census data because you can get some of this information um, from the census about how many Australians have mortgages and how many have mm -hmm. homes that they've paid off the mortgages and things like that. Yeah. So, um, so and when you look at these banks, they off they report this data too. So the mm -hmm. banks in Australia have to report to the regulator, which is APRA. So it's just so you know, APRA. Um, not APRA, if you're an OT, but APRA is the banking regulator. ASIC is the financial regulator. So it sounds like it's the same thing, but they're not. So we are regulated by ASIC. Commonwealth Bank is regulated by APRA. And so when the banks, as part of their kind of regulation, they have to report who got a loan, how many loans have you given out, you know, all of this stuff. What credit cards do you have available to people? And they have to report this every month. And so you can actually get that data from APRA. You can go directly and say, oh, how many loans does, like how big are the loans that CBA has and blah, 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 blah. And you can use that data to work out how many loans there are, who's doing what, who's growing, who's not. Yeah. Um, it's a common source of data. And the banks throw this in front of you, especially CBA, because CBA is like, look how big we are. We are the biggest. We are the best. Yeah. Um, and also you can find data, I think it was, I was on the ADI website, of how much CBA and all the banks have in deposits yeah. and that data is reported on a monthly basis. So mm -hmm. it's quite interesting, the information that the, the government and the regulators put out there. If you go looking for it, I hadn't come across this before, but CBA was definitely leading in terms of the billions and billions in deposits. Yeah. And they have to because it's all about financial stability. If say, CBA was to blow up, today, the whole country would just fall to its knees. Um, and that's just the reality. Like yeah. it's, so they have to be highly regulated. One of the things that has changed over the past 10 years, however, Kate, is the um, open banking regulation, which basically meant that consumers had more control. It used to be really hard, really hard to change mortgages. But now you can basically just go, okay, I'm with CBA. I'm just going to go to ING and be like, hey, ING, what's the best rate you got? Okay, great. Thank you. I'll go back to CBA. Can you match ING's rate? Nope. Okay, I'm switching. But in the past, you'd have to pay expensive fees and there'd be all these different things you'd have to go through and it'd take a long time. But now it's just, I'm switching. And what's also happened as part of this is the data that circulates in the economy is more open. And for individual companies, they have to be willing to give up certain things. So they have to report things. So this is the reason that we have fintechs in Australia because of this initiative. It basically opened the door for companies like Perla, who are one of our sponsors, uh, and other companies in the industry like neobanks to enter and to provide new solutions. UpBank is a result of open banking. Yeah. So this is a kind of the way the industry is going is it's becoming more tech enabled. And that starts with regulation, which is very serious for banks, obviously. Um, and it's pushing more and more towards like how can we solve problems with technology, which yeah. is pretty cool. And also security. Like you want to know that your bank yeah. is secure. So CBA is spending a lot of money on cyber security. And it's something else I've noticed just 
personally is that the banks for a while, they were spinning things off, they were separating. So your banking product got quite simple, but now things are coming back in house and CBA app is offering all sorts of different things. Now they, yeah. you can even offset your carbon, um, carbon emissions from your spending now. So it's fascinating what they've pulled in. Yeah. I mean, you can just plant, they just basically go and plant trees. But yeah. But they're trying to add lots of features yeah. in, which- Which is in the past, they would do it all in house. They'd have like Jimmy, Jimmy Bloggs down the hallway does your insurance. Uh, Karen down the end of the, that hallway does your financial plan. And they used to do all that sort of stuff. But now they've got like this one app as like a hub. And then other businesses can like work into it, which yeah. is interesting. So like, okay, you want insurance. We don't do insurance, but you might be able to access it through our marketplace and go and get it over from that place. Yeah. That's probably a better way to handle those types of things, which is kind of cool. Um, in some of your research, Kate, you did identify uh, something that, it was really important about five or 10 years ago, which is this idea that the big banks were getting too powerful in Australia. Like they, the big banks, like even Westpac, um, like they have so many different brands, like NAB owns Ubank. Um, ANZ has different businesses in New Zealand. And all of these banks were controlling other banks without people realizing and they were getting massive. And that's actually a result of all of the banks acquiring other brands. And the regulation in Australia being so hard for international banks to break into. Like HSBC came and tried to get into the market. Obviously, ING's stuck around for a little while. They're one of the banks that has actually survived here in Australia. Mm. But for a long time, it was about the four banks because they were so powerful. And what some regulation came in basically as a result of the GFC when the whole financial system went to crap. Um, and the big banks started to acquire the little banks. And the government basically said from that point on, no more acquisitions, no more. You're like, we've got to have competition in the system. You guys are too big. And so since then, it's been very difficult for the banks to grow by buying other companies. Yeah. And that's why you saw that. We saw the opposite of that where they spun off businesses because they felt a lot of pressure. And that's where we get like, you know, it becomes really opaque and the banking industry is no longer transparent. And, you know, so they tried to stop that. And that's why the banks have jettisoned all those other business units. Yeah. But it's interesting now you'll see some little fintechs pop up, maybe lenders, maybe um, other sorts of technology. And then when you drill down, they're partially owned by one of these banks yeah. or fully owned or funded, venture backed by one of these banks. So the banks are doing all sorts of things. And that's why it's always interesting to scroll down on any financial products page to who owns it. Yeah. You can just scroll down to the footer or you read like the, the actual documents and um, that's why when we say when you put your money in a bank and you're wor you're worried about the, you know your money being safe and there's that deposit guarantee from the government, you've got to make sure that's per ADI most often. So you need to make sure that the bank that you're doing business with is not owned by the same bank because they all fall under the same umbrella. Yeah. Um, and CBA is one of those banks that owns Bank West, for example. So um, I don't know if Bank West has its own um, register, but yeah, you get get a sense of like these banks are everywhere around you and they're just a label. Like in like St. George, if you're listening to this in New South Wales, hello, uh, St. George, you'll know St. George brand. In Victoria, you probably don't really know that brand. Uh, you will you will know Bank of Melbourne, which is owned by Westpac. So um, that's the way to kind of yeah. detangle everything and you can see that it's just really just the same thing with a different skin on it. Yeah, and there's another interesting fact that I sort of came across when I was researching is about the four pillars policy. Yeah, and, and that's, that's this one, yeah. That's to keep competition in the banking market and stop those big four banks that we've mentioned merging together. Yeah. And yeah. so this has been around for a few decades now and it's supposed to four pillars holding up the Australian banking system. And it's also, as I mentioned before, to stop them making more acquisitions and acquiring Bank of Queensland or yeah. uh, Macquarie and all these other banks as well. It protects them. It protects them. I mean, they'd probably be better together, but it protects them by and it ensures competition in the system. Because mm, that's good because then you can look at multiple rates for your home loan and you can shop around. You can look at different banking products, yeah, uh, different brokerage accounts, and that adds competition there as well. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Um, there are certain structural advantages that the big banks have anyway, so it doesn't really matter. They still dominate. Um, but the four pillars policy, uh, there's actually a thing that in Australia that if the four banks were to fail, the economy would just go to cr absolute crap. It would, be, it would be a nightmare. So there's this belief and it's a joke that in Australia, the big banks privatize profits and they socialize losses. So meaning that 
Like we saw this with Qantas during COVID. They cried foul. They got heaps of money and the government really didn't get anything for it. Um, and so that happens, like, for example, during the GFC or during COVID. The government's not just going to stand by and watch one of these banks fail. So what do they do? They will inject the financial system with money. And that benefits bank shareholders at the end of the day. So that's the socialize, meaning the government pays, socialize any losses. And when they make big profits, well, the government doesn't get paid back, does it? The government takes big dividends. And so this is what people say this isn't fair. Um, but that's one of the benefits of owning bank shares. Uh, and Warren Buffett says this, like, banks are basically guaranteed to make a profit because if they don't, there's going to be bigger issues. Mm. And so that's why a lot of people fall back on the banks as part of their share portfolio because they're like, well, if CBA goes bust, I mean, we've got bigger problems. Yep. Uh, but the key point here is just because you own a bank, when I say they're guaranteed to make a profit, that does not mean that they make a profit for you as a shareholder. Your, your shares might fall like NAB, like ANZ, Westpac. These have all been pretty cruddy investments. CBA has been a good one. But it just means that the banks probably won't fail. It's probably the right, right way to phrase that. Yeah, there's so much of our financial ecosystem relies on those pillars. Yeah, absolutely does. Governance, Kate. Yeah, who's Big problem running the, the show? So this is the information that you can find on the company's website, maybe in their investor center. You can look at the annual report, yep. which you can also find by going to the ASX website. You can type in that stock code CBA. Yep. You can go to the page and you can scroll down to news and announcements. And you might have to scroll back a bit, but you'll be able to find a nice glossy annual report. CBA adds a lot of pictures and graphs and makes theirs mm. look really good because they've got a lot of money to spend on it. Yeah. And they uh, they put a lot of work into their AGM and their annual report and their documents. Yeah. If you're a bit of a, a nerdy nerd like me and you like to highlight things using like uh, Preview or Adobe or whatever you use, you want to get the annual report from CBA's website or from one of the third-party websites like Market Index and not the ASX because the ASX is protected. Yeah. So the documents you can't highlight, you can't do this, you can't do that. I prefer to highlight things using the tools and all that and keep notes in my PDFs. So just go to the, the company's website directly. And the annual report from CBA is long, full disclosure, it is very long. Yeah. But it tells you everything you need to know and probably like the first 10 or so pages. You just read the, um, the chairperson's letter, that's the person on top of the board. And then you can read the CEO's or the managing director's letter. Um, those two letters are produced every year and most companies do them. And they tell you, how did we do this year? What are our priorities? What's our strategy? And it goes through at the board level, obviously it's very high level. Like it's like, this is what CBA does in the community. Look how good we are. And then the next one for the C for the CEO's letter, that one tells you, no, here's how our actual operations worked out. And then if there's another letter, it would be from the CFO, the financial officer. And they'll say, and here's how our financials worked out. And so those letters alone will tell you a lot you need to know about the bank. Yeah. And you can also have a look at their AGM. The good thing with the CBA one is they break out the CEO uh, address. You can read that by itself uh, because their AGM was over three hours last year because they let a lot of people ask questions. Yeah. I think that when I was listening to the start, you could ask two, two questions per person per item of business. So there was a lot of, a lot of questions you could ask. Um, so the chairperson at the moment is Mr. Paul O'Malley. They previously had a female chairperson, mm -hmm. so that is good to note. So Paul has been chairperson since August this year mm -hmm. yep, and has been on the board for a couple of years now. Yep. And you can have a look at what their previous experience was. So previously served as managing director and CEO of Blue Scope Steel for 10 years. Mm -hmm. So that's quite a large Aussie business. Yes, it is. Um, and it does it, steel of all things. Yeah. A little bit different, yeah. Uh, but it does see, hey, say he has a strong background in finance and accounting, and worked in investment banking and audit, uh, yep. doing other things in steel, and is trustee of the Melbourne Cricket Ground Trust. So once you get to that point, they often are trustee or on the board of some other things yeah. that aren't really finance related. Like he's a non-executive director of Coles Group. When it says non-executive in someone's Bio, non-executive means they're not involved in the day-to-day -day running. They yep. just meet up for every, you know, three months and have a yarn about how the company's doing. If it says independent, it means they're also independent of the company. So they're the best you can get is independent non-executive because mm -hmm. it means they're not involved in the day-to-day -day and they're independent of shareholders and all this sort of stuff. They are just there to provide oversight, just so yep. you know. Because I was often confused about that. What's an mm. executive director versus a non-executive director? That's yeah. That's the difference. 
And then the Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer at the moment is Matt Common. Is yes. that how you say it? I think so, yes. Yeah. So he has been running the show since 2018 and has been working in banking his whole life. I remember when I went on Sky Business one day. This was during COVID. I looked like a train wreck, by the way. It was early Sunday morning. And uh, I was talking about something. And then the next person on the show was Matt Common. <laughs> I was like, oh, well, I'm out of my league here. Um, and then I was talking about Ample, you know, the fuels service I station. I've heard of it, yep. Then the CEO was on after that, and I'm like, hmm, probably shouldn't have said what I said. <laughs> so, anyway, yeah. fun note. So, so Matt, tell yeah, us about Matt. Matt has been working for CBA since 1999. So, yeah, as we'd time. say, a career banker. Would you say career banker? <laughs> No, it's just my mind went elsewhere. Okay. <laughs> Never mind. Uh, so he was working in the retail banking group and running that at CBA for a while. Mm. Um, he was managing director prior to that of their digital business, Comsec, and working yep. there. So he's been working a lot in the technology side of the business Which and is the, the right retail thing for business. So he, he speaks really well. Yeah. So of can- all the bank CEOs, he speaks really well. Yeah, so you can probably find some podcasts or some speeches he's done in the past. Yeah, uh, he took or over AGM. from Ian Narev, was it? Yep, Ian yep. Narev, who's now at Seek. Seek, yes. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and a lot of there's been a lot of change. You mentioned before there was a female, I think it was Catherine Livingston, if mm. I'm not mistaken. Um, there's been a lot of change at the banks, and that's because of the well, not because, but partly because of the Royal Commission. Some people got the sack after heads that. rolled, you know, and then you know they were chopped off at the top. <laughs> Yeah, the, it's when something goes wrong in one of these t- like Titanics of financial system, it's the chair and it is the CEO. So you'd spend twenty years getting to that position, and then all of a sudden something goes wrong in Department Six One F Level Three, and you're like, that the media makes a blitz out of it, and you're like, oh shit, what the hell is that department? Mm. And then you lose your job. Yeah, <laughs> that's basically the way it works. Why didn't you provide oversight? So Catherine Livingston is correct, Owen. She Ooh. retired and stepped ding, down ding, from ding. the board in August of 2022. Yeah, I think she was there for quite a while. Yeah, she joined the board in 2016 and became chair in 2017. So I guess it's five years was there Four through the Royal Commission. Yeah, um, and there have been some really, and and I know we're not making a thing of it, but um, there have been some really fantastic executives, uh, female executives in Australian banking. Uh, the ex-CEO or managing director, I can't remember the title, of Westpac uh, was included in that. And um, Shamara from Macquarie, the bank that I mentioned before, incredible executive. Um, one of the world's most influential women now um, mm. because of it, not just because of her role at Macquarie, but um, yeah, so Australian banks, for you know, we have pretty bad culture for in the banking system. It's fair to say, but we do some things right, and that's something that we've done really well. Uh, it's getting more women in these executive positions, so I think we'd love to see more of it. But it's good. Yeah. Uh, and so, in terms of sustainability, this is a really good one, and it's one that I highlighted in the um, the ethical investing course on RASC Education. Uh, if you've taken that course, thank you. The ethical um, considerations at CBA are actually front of mind, which is really good. Uh, and they do make a point of being like, look how much better than the other banks we are. <laughs> but then that's like comparing yourself to like, look at these guys over in the corner here. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, so, but they actually do make a very concerted effort of, of reporting the important um, information. And so CBA actually publishes a separate report in addition to its annual report, its sustainability report. And it goes into great detail about everything which is really important because there's a belief in Australia and globally, and I, I'm coming around to this view that the single most important thing you can do if you want to invest ethically is not to avoid companies, but to invest in companies that can make a change. Mm. So that would be companies like CBA, which provide financing to companies. So if you can be active with CBA, then CBA can be active with its customers and say, oh, you run a coal, you know, whatever. Yeah. We want you to report your analytics to us. Or um, if you're in gambling, well, we want you to do this and this and this. And then you, through CBA, they can become more effective um, yeah. as well as reporting what they're doing themselves. And so- And they kind of set the tone for some of the other banks and absolutely. people in the finance industry because if they're doing it, then that trickles down and they have a lot of um, financial power in terms of what they can lend to sustainable energy projects with 
green loans and green bonds and things like that. So I think it's really an interesting case study because I know some people say they do not want the banks in their ETF because they don't see that as an ethical investment. Yeah. And I would say yes, but at the same time, you've got to have, like you don't have to invest in them, but if you want a thriving economy, you have to have banks. Yeah. Like unless we go into like the Bitcoin, you know, multiverse, um, it, you still need centralized banking. And so we want these things to be regulated. And um, I think they do a very good job of it. And if you, the one really good indicator, <laughs> Which we, which I use, which we use, is you can actually, and I'm glad you included this in the show notes, Kate. Is um, you can go onto HR websites and you can look at the reviews that employees give of the CEO and of the culture and of the the conditions in, in which they work. Yeah. And one of those is Glassdoor, and we can see that there's a 94% approval rating of the CEO Matt Common, which is fantastic. So. That's very, very high rating. That's like technology executive high yeah. rating. So I would just say, you know, you can check these things not just through CBA's sustainability report, but actually go to a third party website and you can check it there. Let's have a quick look at um, if I can get it up. And given they've got around 40,000 employees at the moment, yeah. it's a huge data set. Yeah. So it's not like when you go to some of these review websites, you get like three reviews and you're like, and then oh, it's very, sense. it's usually someone that's disgruntled. You, yeah. You'll get the extremes when there's only a small sample. Absolutely. So here we can see um, on the Westpac one for Glassdoor, the approval rating is 82%. Mm. So it's t- like 10% less or more. Um, so that is an indicator to me when you work at one of these gigantic, like like the Titanic of working yeah. environments, you want the culture to be right. And that's something that we've always asked of the banks. So it feels like we're just doing like a massive like pump up for... CBA, but this is the, these are just the things that we look at, and this is probably what makes it better yep. in the banks. So we're going to have a quick – you're going to take us quickly through some financial points, Owen? Yeah. So I think the best thing you can do is I actually um, covered CBA in a self-wealth live, but I also covered it um, for the Value Investor Program. I actually showed in detail how to study C- CBA's results. So maybe rather than get bogged down in numbers, I will just explain some of the key measures that you need to look at when you study a bank because that would be more insightful to you. Um, Let's just start at the top. So a bank makes money, uh, and you can check this on its income statement. A bank makes money by issuing loans, right? Now, if you think about it from our perspective, like Kate, you got a loan through CBA, um, you get money and you owe the bank money plus interest, right? But you get that money up front, that huge amount of money, and then you slowly pay it back over say 10, 20, 30 years, whatever, right? So what the banks effectively do is they give money out in exchange for long-term returns, right? But if you think about it from the bank's perspective, that's cash going out and then getting cash coming back in slowly over time. Now. When it comes to a normal bank like Wool- a normal company like Woolworths, if you saw that, you'd be like, "Well, they're, that's they're giving money out. That's like bad." Um, whereas with CBA, giving money out is a good thing because you're lending money as part of your business. You're lending money and you're returning money back in over time. So what actually happens is when you look at a bank versus when you look at a Woolworths, a normal business, the financials are kind of the opposite way around. So if you go to the balance sheet of Commonwealth Bank, what you will see is it will have this thing that says loans, but loans will be an asset Mm. because that's part of their business. Whereas if you go to Woolworths, it will say loans and that'll be a liability because that's a bad thing. Yeah. So the first thing to understand is how does a bank make money? And what you'll see is on the income statement, you'll see interest received. It's it's, It's called net interest. And that's basically from all of the people like Kate, the 850,000 people that have a mortgage, they slowly pay money back. Yeah, and at the moment, your variable rate's going up, so you're paying more to the bank each month. Yes, you're paying more. So if you just looked at... So this is why I said net interest before. Mm. So a lot of people might be thinking, well, you just look at interest. But if you only looked at interest, you would say, yes, it's going up. But CBA then, on the other side of their ledger, has to pay the deposit holders more 
Yes, because your savings account interest rate is also going up. Yeah, so CBA funds over 70% of its loans through term deposits. Hmm. So that's really interesting because most of the banks aren't at that level. Yeah. And that's, I don't know how they managed to do this, to be honest, because it's so much money that they can be deposit funded, basically. So customers funding the bank's activities. And to give you a sense of it, it's hundreds of billions of dollars in loans. So that means they'd have to have hundreds of billions of dollars in term deposits or like types of savings accounts and whatever. Yeah. But at the end of the day, a bank earns something that we call net interest margin. This is a comparison of what do we re- what do we give out and what do we to deposit holders and what do we receive from mortgages? There's a tiny little percent there. Then we divide that by the amount of loads. And basically what that says is how much are we earning every year from the loans we have outstanding? And it just so happens, you might be surprised about this, CBA's profit margin is about 2%. Just 2%, Mm. right? But that's before it pays its staff. So you think to yourself, how can it only make 2% but pay staff? Like how is this the biggest company? Because it has so many loans that that 2% on a huge amount of money is actually a lot. Yeah. We're talking billions of dollars. And so then it hires 800 more software engineers and you're like, wow, that's a big commitment. Yeah. Right? But for a company that has $500 billion of loans making 2%, it's not that big of a deal. So the metrics that we look at here are how much does it lend out? That's called like it's sometimes called total loans and advances. That's on the balance sheet. Net interest income net meaning that it takes away the, how much it pays in interest that's on the income statement and that's expressed and then also all of that will be expressed as a percentage called the net interest margin n i m nim i don't know if anyone calls it that but we'll just you, go nim you could start it. it's a thing <laughs> social media blitz let's do it um so that's one thing now um the common the common thing is when people learn about how a bank works it's like we'll just go lend money like go and lend it right and then you think yes you could just lend money bring money in the door through return deposits lend money bring money in the door and so on and so forth but what happens is if your bank grows too quickly you will find that they start lending to riskier and riskier and riskier people and what happens is you end up with what happened in the gfc where some banks went bust because they were lending money to imagine Kate times 0.5. So not quite as reliable as Kate here in yeah. front of me. And they say, here you go, Kate. I don't know how big your loan is, but let's say, here you go, Kate. Here's half a million dollars. And don't worry, we'll charge a very small amount of interest. We think you're reliable. Turns out you're not reliable. You don't pay it back. And the bank's just going, holy heck, we're going to get that back over 30 years. Yeah, We've just lost a heap of that money. And that's when banks go bust. So one of the things that we look at, and they always disclose this in their investor presentations. This is the final thing I say, because I know I'm getting pretty nerdy. But they call this system growth. So what they do is they basically take the whole of Australia's mortgages, for example, and they say, the whole mortgages in Australia are growing at 5%. But then what CBA will do is say, we grew at 5.1%, just a little bit more. So what that means is they're growing above system. You'll see that word. So if you see that, that's just, I just wanted to debunk that. What does above system, below system mean? It's like saying, here's the peer group. We did a little bit better than average. Yeah. And that's what you want. You don't want them to be like double. Because if they're double, then that means that they're lending to people that other people won't lend to. Mm. So that's how banks get into trouble. Yeah. So it's a bit confusing. It's all in there. And if you want to learn more, go and check out the Value Investor Program because I go through CBA and how to analyze it. Um, but those are some of the things you want to look at. I- income, the net interest margin for sustainability, how quickly is it lending? And finally, you want to look at dividends. Yes, because- Big dividends. I saw Big it Aussie like D's. CBA pays a huge amount of its profits out as a dividend yep. to all of its shareholders and you. Part, yep. makes up part of your ETF distributions if you own an ASX ETF. ASX, indeed. Um, the thing is that- yeah, it, it pays big dividends, and if you wanted to boil it down to the simplest possible number, dividends would be the thing you'd look at for a bank because it's not going to grow as fast as some of the technology companies, but it will be more reliable 
because of all the regulation and all that sort of stuff that we mentioned before. So dividends are one thing. And you can go wrong with banks. Like look at all the other banks, basically besides Macquarie. They yeah. have struggled. There's some smaller listed banks that haven't performed very well at all. Yeah, like Bank of Queensland. And even Suncorp decided to sell its banking division to ANZ because it's not like Suncorp does insurance, like um, Bingle, mm. um, but it also has a bank, and it just was like it wasn't performing. So it would be better to sell it to ANZ than it would be to try and compete. Yeah, uh, and so at the end of the day, you can boil it down to dividends. Um, CBA's has grown its dividend for many, many years, and it's because it's competitively advantaged. When we did the episode on moats not too long ago, Kate. You remember we talked about what makes a business special. CBA is the biggest. It's the most efficient. It's got the best technology. It's getting all the engineers. <laughs> getting all the engineers because it's paying them a bucket load. Yeah. So that is why it can keep paying bigger and bigger dividends over many years. Yeah. That's no, very interesting. And I thought the other point to note was just how big of a taxpayer it is in Australia. Yeah. Like it's one of Australia's largest taxpayer. I mean, this slide I was looking at from their last presentation, they pay over a billion dollars of tax. Yeah, so the the total tax expense that we're looking at here on the slide, Kate, is three point six billion dollars, right? Mm. The the one point four billion that you're referring to, that's just for the PAYG. Oh, the employees, right? That's just for the employees. <laughs> yeah. So it pays its own tax as well, but it also pays tax just you know when you get your paycheck and the, your company sends some money to the ATO so you can get a tax yeah, return. Okay. That's the one point four billion that Off it their pays. Fifty thousand employees. Yeah. Plus they pay a lot of tax. Plus they pay income tax. So unlike some of these multinationals, like not to name names, Google, but there are other companies that can kind of like be like, oh yeah, like we make we pay tax. No, here's tax. I'll show you what tax looks like. Yeah. Look at CVA's financials. So that would fund a huge amount of government programs. And oh, absolutely. Yeah. So. That's probably something else I'd look at if I was looking at the ethical considerations of owning something like CBA or mm. owning it in my ETF, that it does contribute a huge amount to the Australian economy. Yeah, banks can do good things. Like, this is the thing. Like, we always say, like, you know, how bad banks are. But I want you to imagine a future or imagine a reality where we don't have big banks. What would that feel like? I can tell you what it would feel like. It would feel very scary. Because you wouldn't trust the banking system. Yeah. And, you know, we see all, see all this shit come out in the, excuse my French, in the uh, Royal Commission. And we see CBA fined $500 million. Westpac fined a, mil- a billion dollars, right? But have it, guess what? They can pay it. Yeah. Imagine all the banks if we had small banks that couldn't pay it. So that's one of the benefits of having such strong banks is we have confidence that our money will be safe. Yeah, and there's co- very strong remediation processes. Yeah, if they stuff up, they're going to be penalized and people are going to get paid back. That's the key here. Um, and so if we're like wishing for a different outcome for our banks, I feel like that's pretty scary to me. I don't own bank shares. I have no dog in this fight, really. I couldn't care. But like it's um, for the most part, I think they've done a pretty good job. They could be better. Culture's getting better, which is good. That's what we need from the banks. Yeah, we just got to keep pushing them as society to do better and so that the events that cause the Royal Commission don't keep repeating themselves. Yeah, and one thing you can do is you can vote with your investment wallet. Like, go and support things like the Australian Shareholders Association, rock up to the AGMs, ask questions, yeah. like put them under heat, make them squirm for their $5 million a year or whatever they get paid. Like, um, that's what they're paid so much money for. So, yeah. I, all in all, Kate, I think if we just conclude, CBA is one of the banks that has an extremely impressive track record on the stock market. It's paid a huge fully frank dividends. It's grown very well and it keeps investing back into its business. Where other businesses and banks have faltered, CBA has accelerated. So some of the banks have tried to play catch up with CBA and in turn got themselves in more trouble because they're over investing or trying to lend too much money. Um, there are plenty of risks that we should highlight things like if the Australian property market falls, that's not good for banks. If um, some of the banks rely on overseas markets to get their funding, so CBA relies on term deposits, but some banks don't, and that can cause issues. A recession is not good for banks. Um, so there are other things that should come into play, but for the most part, CBA is quite impressive. Yeah, and we don't own it, but we get exposure to quite a lot of it for our ETFs and our super fund. Yep. If I, I would ha- I would be happy to have a small part of my portfolio in CBA shares, hmm. but I'd just be mindful if I had CBA, I wouldn't want Westpac, NAB, like all of them, 
as well as an ETF that invests in them. Yeah. I think that's a risk that people fall into. So if I was designing a retiree portfolio, which was focused on dividend income, I'd probably still use an ETF. I would definitely prefer an ETF over just one individual stock, but I would be okay if one of, if I was an imaginary financial advisor and someone had a CBA shares in their portfolio. Yeah. 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 Because we, we talked about overlap recently when we were looking at our ETF series and hmm. that's worth pointing out here that because CBA is such a big part of your ASX 200 ETF, if you added CBA shares, you would be increasing that exposure to CBA and that yep. may or may not be what you want to do. Yeah. So, yeah, and that's the thing. Like we already said, what was it, like 20% in banks? Yeah. So, and if you add Macquarie, it's even more than that. Yeah. So, you're going to get banks even through your ETF. But, you know, the way I think about a lot of our listeners, Kate, is that a lot of our listeners are going to move to ETFs for the yeah. majority of their portfolio, just like you and I. But there will come a time when you think, hmm, maybe I'll buy an individual share. Maybe I want to learn about this company. I think CBA, we did Woolworths not too long ago. Yeah, These we've done gr- Fortescue. We've done Fortescue. Macquarie. Macquarie. They're just interesting because they're large companies. There's a lot of information you can look at. Yeah. And you can... These are really interesting ways... These are really interesting companies to step off of ETF investing and try your hand at investing. Yeah. Um, Rather than going, okay, I've got my Vanguard ETF. Now I'm going to buy the speculative miner from Africa. Yes. But it's very hard to find any information about <laughs> yeah. it. Probably is not Who knows going what's to going on. work out. But if you are interested in learning more about ETFs and individual company investing, we do have a membership for that. Yes, we do. RAS Core. You can join um, RAS Core. It's now a month-to-month subscription. Just like your Netflix, your Uber One, and your Spotify. Yes. And it's only $9.99 a month. So if you are wanting to join us, you want to ask me questions about CBA or about any of your banks, uh, you want to see which ETFs we recommend, um, please jump in. It's $9.99 a month. It's, investment in future you. It's an investment in future. It's cheaper than Netflix if you have HD streaming, I believe. <laughs> and which one's more important, people? <laughs> Come on in. <laughs> so, but no, seriously, we made it so low so it's accessible to the most people possible. Don't go ahead and buy a course off the RASC education site until you've considered the membership because you get all of the beginner courses included in the membership. So it makes a lot of sense. And it's, yeah, it's a really small fee to pay and you get to ask questions and join the community. So thank you. Yeah. Kate? What an episode. What an episode. Do you think you could ever just sit down and talk for 40 minutes about a bank? Well, we've done it before. I've done it (laughs) with other people. So, um, But maybe this Uh, is... Uh, Not something you would do every time with your friends. But we will put all the links um, Mm -hmm. in the show notes. I've done research on a few more resources, so I'll put them there. So if you are interested in doing your own research on CBA, I'll put it all there. And I'll put links to Rascore as well if anyone's interested in joining us there. Yep. Cool. Yeah. So CBA, good bank. Um, Tech tech First is the bank uh, that CBA is. So uh, really interesting Really long-term performer for investors as well. Pop it on your watch list. Kate, as always, thanks for joining me. Thanks for listening, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Australian Finance Podcast, where our mission is to improve the financial futures of all Australians. If you'd like to learn more, create a free account at rusk.com.au forward slash account to download free episode workbooks, bonus resources, and take our amazing free personal finance courses. You can also join our online community by following the link in the description. If you enjoyed the show, what we'd love is for you to leave us a snappy review on iTunes. And you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Rask Australia. Kate and I are also on both of those channels. Finally, if you have any feedback, suggestions for episodes or guests to come on the show, or you just have a question for us, shoot us an email at podcast at rask.com.au. This podcast was proudly sponsored by InvestSmart's Bootcamp for Beginner Investors. Build your investing confidence for only $49.50. Learn what it takes to be a successful investor with InvestSmart's Bootcamp for Beginners. This online course is self-paced over three months with live weekly webinars designed to help you achieve your financial goals and create wealth. To start your investing journey today, head to investsmart.com.au slash bootcamp or simply click the link in your podcast player.